if you leave the meeting will the recording get stopped automatically no no no, no it will not i will keep the meeting i'll be on hold uh, shouldn't be any problem great yeah that, that that has been tested akshay i do this uh, very often so <laughs> many group meetings i'll have to step out in between and uh, i have them recorded so not a problem all right then let's get started and um, so it's our great pleasure to uh, invite Professor Vaibhav Madhok of IIT Madras to deliver this lecture in the IQTI Quantox series. Incidentally, IIT Madras also has a seminar series which with exactly the same name, but for a capital T in our edition, I guess. So uh, welcome Vaibhav and uh, to introduce Vaibhav uh, received his bachelor's in technology in computer science and engineering from University of Pune and went on to do a PhD from University of New Mexico under uh, Professor Ivan Deutsch. And he worked on uh, quantum chaos and quantum information related uh, topics during his PhD. And after postdoctoral positions in Waterloo and University of British Columbia, where he worked on diverse uh, set of topics connecting biological systems and other things, he has joined uh, IIT Madras as a faculty in the physics department and has been working in a wide variety of topics related to dynamical systems, classical and quantum chaotic systems, then quantum information, entanglement and non-classical correlations, quantum foundations and quantum to classical transitions on which uh, he and I have been collaborating for the last few, uh, last couple years in fact. And today he's going to talk about chaos and information in the quantum world. Okay, over to Vaibhav. So before uh, we hand over to Vaibhav, a few administrative things. So I'll be moderating the question and answers. If you feel like, uh, if you have a question, please raise, use the raise hand tool and I will uh, ask you to unmute and uh, ask the question. If you don't want to unmute, you can post the question on the chat box, which I'll read out. And this talk is being recorded. So, and uh, the link will be provided later on uh, the YouTube channel. Yeah. So, any other things that uh, Sri Vidya or Akshay want to add? All right, then over to Vaibhav. Thank you, Bala. And I must just say, uh, you know, thank you everyone at ISC for the invitation. And if there is a pressing question and you just want to barge in, just feel free to, you know, circumvent all Bala said, just ask away. The only thing is that I am now going to go full screen, so I won't be able to see you. So that's why we need Bala to moderate things. So Bala, if you can teach me again, what are you seeing uh, right now? Uh, so right now uh, you just need to click on your PDF and go full screen by her. Uh, okay, so full let you view full screen. Uh, view. Enter full screen. Yeah. Full screen. Is that okay? Can you see now? The... Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome everyone. So I'm going to talk about chaos and information in the quantum world. So since Bala told me that this is going on YouTube, this is where we are. Everyone, of course, in India knows where Chennai IIT Madras is. And uh, uh, yeah, so we are in a coastal city south of India. So zooming this picture up, what's the big picture? Well, the universe as we know is quantum, uh, yet classical mechanics gives an excellent description of the macroscopic world. So essentially, my talk, you can say, is about the tale of two theories. Uh, by the way, do you guys see my mouse pointer? Uh, yes. OK. Yes. Yeah. So it's a tale of two theories, quantum and classical physics. This is a cartoon from an article Zurich wrote. On the left side, we have the quantum world with wonderful properties, Schrodinger's cat, quantum superposition entanglement, quantum measurements, which themselves are, uh, you know, uh, quite a contentious issue in quantum mechanics. And on the right side, I have got uh, Newton's laws mainly and classical correlations. And I have put chaos on the border between classical and uh, quantum mechanics. We'll come to that in a minute. So what are the kind of questions we are interested in? We are interested in actually probing the border, the quantum classical border. For example, the question we might ask is that what distinguishes quantum states 
from classical probability distributions or fundamental question of quantum to classical transition. How does classical behavior emerge out of underlying quantum mechanics? Um, and the related question is, uh, you know, what happens to chaos? Chaos conventionally is studied uh, under the paradigm of classical dynamical systems. Uh, the question we might ask is what happens to chaos or what are the ways to characterize chaos in the quantum world? Are there any footprints or signatures of chaos uh, in, in the quantum world? So before going any further, uh, let's see what does chaos mean classically? So first of all, we are dealing with deterministic systems and chaos is determined as aperiodic long-term behavior in a deterministic system. And one of the hallmarks of chaos is sensitive dependence to initial conditions. Trajectories starting very close to each other separate out exponentially fast given by something called as the characteristic Lyapunov exponents of the system. This is the exponential rate of separation of nearby trajectories. So what happens to chaos in the quantum world? So first of all, there's this quote, anyone who uses quantum and chaos in the same sentence should be hung by his thumbs on a tree in a park behind Niels Bohr's Institute. So, I mean, I, the, the message is that characterizing chaos has been a controversial and contentious issue uh, uh, quantum mechanically. And it's not hard to see why uh, we have the unitary evolution in quantum mechanics and uh, you know off goes for toss uh, exponential separation of trajectories not only is uh, the unitary ev evolution actually preserves the overlap of two different state vectors so in fact the overlap or the distance between state vectors is actually a constant of motion but the question still remains uh, whether this is truly an accurate way of uh, studying chaos. Um, you see, classical mechanics also can be, uh, uh, can be developed using probability distribution in phase space. And using the Louis Louisvillian operator, even classical mechanics preserves the overlap between probability densities. So by that logic, there should not be any chaos classically also. Uh, and I think the, the 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 misunderstanding lies in that the state vectors are analog of probability distributions uh, classically, not of point particles or trajectories uh, classically. So, but the question still remains: What are the ways to characterize chaos in quantum mechanics, or what are the signatures of chaos? Now, I must say that uh, this field is not merely fixing a definition of chaos quantum mechanically. Otherwise, that would be very boring. Uh, there are calculations, for example, Zurich showed that if he calculates solar system purely quantum mechanically, then the solar system or let's say the satellite of Jupiter on which he did calculation, that should fall off the solar system in an order of 100 years. So needless to say that doesn't happen, but essentially chaos has remarkable consequences to something known as the Arendt-Fest correspondence, which actually gives you a characteristic time scales quantum expectation values are going to follow classical trajectories. And for chaotic systems, uh, the Arendt-Fest correspondence time is exponentially small as compared to regular systems. We'll come to Arendt-Fest correspondence later on in the talk, but the, the, the message I want to say is that, uh, uh, you know, this question has uh, fundamental consequences for quantum to classical transition and also on the technology side. So uh, we just saw that uh, though quantum states are uh, not sensitive uh, to, you know, initial, uh, the quantum dynamics is going to preserve the distance between initial quantum states. Uh, they are not sensitive to, sensitive to uh, changes in the parameter of the Hamiltonian. So uh, one can ask under what conditions sensitivity to parameters in the Hamiltonian can influence our ability to perform information tasks. So for example, over here, I have uh, the overlap starting from the same state. Um, I think there's a typo here, but I evolve the state using H uh, forward, and then I evolve backward using a perturbed Hamiltonian. And how past this overlap decays is one of the ways of benchmarking chaos. And if you 
look at it. This is exactly what happens in the experiment. One is never sure of uh, the magnetic fields, the exact values of uh, the Hamiltonian we are going to produce. So at the end of the day, our system will always have some unavoidable errors. And the bottom line is that why is this important? Well, at the end of the day, our quantum system, whether it's a many body quantum computer or a quantum simulator, at the end of the day, it is governed by a many body Hamiltonian, which is going to be chaotic. So, so sorry, can I ask a question now? Please, please, sure. Okay, so this is the Bindu from RRI. So uh, I have this question for epsilon, uh, para, like vessel which you told. So uh -huh. is means how small that epsilon needs to be? So uh, it's a perturbation. Yes, but uh, do I means can I take epsilon tends to zero like in the Lupin of exponent definition one uh -huh. generally does? Uh -huh. Yeah, you can. So there are various regimes of fall of this decay. So for a smaller epsilon, there is a quadratic decay, then there is an exponential regime, so on and so forth. So there are various regimes to study these sort of things depending upon the strength of the epsilon. Yeah, but then which one will you call chaotic or will you define a different chaotic behavior? See, the chaotic systems have a very universal fall of the decay depending upon epsilon and that is a pretty well established theory and for mm -hmm. different values of epsilon there are different regimes which all chaotic systems generally follow that universal trend. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to understand that you, you said that it means there will be different kind of fall in different order of epsilon. So uh -huh. would you call it like first order chaos, second order or would you classify them or will you say all are similar chaos? Uh, that's what I said. Uh, mm. Systems which are chaotic in the classical limit. Okay. They have a very standard universal way of uh, showing this decay of this, uh, this, this quantity. And uh, what about quantum, fully quantum system, like which does not have classical counterpart? Yeah, so the, you see, if you uh, have a fully quantum system which does not have a classical counterpart, then uh, you know there are ways of characterizing chaos purely quantum mechanically. But and, not this one. Uh, well, this so for many body systems, for example, uh, uh, you you will have uh, certainly a decay and chaotic systems. You can distinguish. So there are things like adiabatic gauge potential, fall of this echo. You can still distinguish integrability, non-integrability, integrability chaos using this sort of a technology. Uh, so uh, what what my focus was to explain what happens to systems which are chaotic in the classical limit. OK, OK. So you are mostly interested in semi-classical system somewhere. Uh, semi -classical system, we, are, we are going to. So uh, as it turns out that, of course, we'll start with semi-classical systems, but this this technology and all these quantities we are going to see mm -hmm. OTOCs, Loschmittico, all these things are. Uh, that is my another question. I guess it's also very similar to Loschmittico, right? This quantity. This is actually the Loschmittico. I mean, I yeah. forgot to put the bars on it, the, the, yeah. the magnitude of it. Yeah, so this is actually Loschmittico. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I. <coughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we want a controllable quantum system, not something as a random custom. So uh, uh, let's take an example of, for example, the wave particle duality, where, you know, we know that. We detect electrons in a double slit as a particle, yet they show uh, rich interference phenomena. Uh, so the question we might ask is, what is the closest thing to wave particle duality for an engineer? And one possible answer is an analog simulator versus a digital quantum device. So by an analog quantum simulator, I mean my signal is not error corrected. I do not have a fully developed quantum error correction for it. Whereas for a circuit model quantum computer, I treat it as a digital uh, device because I have a quantum error correction, fault tolerance, and uh, uh, you know other well-established uh, uh, error correcting mechanisms for it. So the, the question uh, of uh, many body physics, nonlinear dynamics, chaos in the quantum world boils down to, can I trust my analog protocols? when we have no error correction. So that's uh, that's the question. 
So just to set up the context, uh, uh, let's see how uh, you know we can use quantum tomography as a paradigm to study uh, quantum chaos. So just for a moment, uh, take this test. So you know uh, this is a crossword puzzle, and essentially tomography is the art of finding the unknown. So I give you another thing. So in your head, you are performing this maximum likelihood estimate. You have some partial knowledge and you're going to get. And if you look at it, the first thing is the game show. And uh, the second was the quiz show. Now you essentially performed a tomography in your brain. Uh, you can also perhaps notice that figuring out quiz was easier because of the prior information. Uh, typically in English, Q follows words like you or something. So this thing was a bit easier. So there is essentially estimation, maximum likelihood estimation and the role of prior information in estimation process. So uh, let's see what is the connection between uh, information, tomography and chaos. So over here, I have an example of a chaotic system. Uh, it's a on the and, and a regular system. So on the left hand side, I have a very regular system. It is predictable and it is periodic. So in some sense, this is a very boring signal. Uh, this signal goes on and on repeating itself. And if I follow this trajectory, I learn nothing new. On the right side, I have a chaotic trajectory uh, which winds and folds and turns in an unpredictable way. And uh, as I track this trajectory, I'm learning something. So one might ask that. Uh, what is it exactly I'm learning in this particular system? Uh, if I follow this trajectory, an unpredictable trajectory and the flip side of unpredictability is information. What am I learning um, from this trajectory? And the answer is that I'm learning about the initial conditions where the system started. And this can be formulated in uh, uh, in terms of the Kolmogorov-Sunai entropy, which basically means that a tra chaotic trajectory acts as a source of information. And as I follow a single trajectory, one gains information about initial conditions of the trajectory and this rate at which I'm learning about the initial conditions of that system on increasingly finer scales is known as the Kolmogorov-Sinai entropy, which is also related to the Lyapunov exponents of the system. So how, we see how far we can take this analogy in the quantum world. So here, this is exactly my setting for uh, continuous measurement quantum tomography. So over here, like the classical system, I had a trajectory. Over here, I have a trajectory or a time series. So what the setting is that I have an ensemble of unknown quantum states uh, which are identically prepared, uh, collectively and coherently evolved, and they go evolution and measurement. And uh, under the regime we are working in of uh, weak continuous measurement, I get a continuous time series of the expectation values of a Hermitian operator. Uh, and uh, now the idea is that once I have this time series of expectation values of a single observable, so this is the observable O of T evolved in the Heisenberg picture. I have to invert this measurement record to learn about this unknown quantum state. And uh, we gain information about this initial state by continuously measuring the system. And uh, we use some estimator, and this is the reconstructed quantum state. So this is basically the, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of the algorithm. I discretize my signal uh, in the previous continuous signal. I discretize it at uh, time step i, and I parameterize my density matrix uh, in terms of uh, uh, generalized block vector. And these are the parameters R alphas I'm interested in. And uh, what I do is that I invert the measurement record. And since this is an over specified system of equations, I found the least square estimate of the parameters characterizing the density matrix contingent upon this particular measurement record. Uh, 
um, we can see this in terms of uh, probabilities also. So uh, this was my measurement record, uh, which was the expectation value of the Hermitian observable plus some noise, short noise due to the probe. So I can express the measurement record given a state as a multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution. And now it just turns out to use Bayes rule to invert this probability. I had the probability of measurement record M given certain parameters. Now I can find the maximum likelihood estimate of what would be the parameters are which are going to maximize my likelihood function uh, so that I get a state which is most consistent with this given measurement record. So this is how the reconstruction algorithm work. And uh, sorry, now, can I interrupt once more time? Yeah. Uh, so I would like to understand what you are trying to explain. So I guess this aim which you have written, it, it's a process with white noise. And then this capital P, the probability which you are writing mostly based on kind of central limit theorem, right? Yes. So yes. then I guess what information will mostly you can get near the mean and around the variance. So yes. Because surely the large deviation and all those are not in within this, within your measurements, within your P function, A or pro not. So then, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so the maximum likelihood estimate will give you the values uh, which are going to the peaks of this multivariate Gaussian. What you said is exactly right. Yes, but then uh, is that enough for uh, reconstruction algorithm which you are trying to build? No, there are, there, are, there are constraints. So for example, this covariance matrix C inverse, uh, the, uh, this uh, plays a very crucial role. So first of all, your, your measurement record has to be inf informationally complete. In the sense that, uh, let's say I'm on a block sphere, I need an information about three directions. I need a direction about X, Y, Z so that I can specify the block vector. So uh, not only I need to have the peak of uh, these Gaussian probability, uh, multivariate Gaussian probability distribution, my, my, uh, my record, my measurement record also has to be informationally complete. That means I need information about these B square minus one parameters in general. Mm -hmm. And also because this is a noisy process, sometimes the RML, the maximum likelihood values are not going to yield you a physical state. So the optimization and the estimation works in two ways. I find the maximum likelihood estimate and then typically what I do in my algorithms, I pick the state which is the closest physical state to the maximum likelihood values. So there is there is more to it, but mm. for now, just assume that uh, I'm doing those things right. And uh, essentially these RML values are giving me an estimate of the state. OK, okay. yeah. OK, so uh, now the question I ask is uh, the following. Uh, I have my measurement record where O sub i was a Heisenberg evolved operator under some dynamics U. And the question I ask is how does the nature of U affect the tomography process? And uh, that brings chaos and the nature of dynamics into this question of information gain, tomography and chaos. And for that, uh, what I do is that I choose uh, a very standard paradigm to study quantum chaos, the kick top, which essentially is a periodic Delta kick uh, Hamiltonian and uh, the unitary operator over a time, uh, over a time period can be factored into a rotation about one particular fixed axis and a nonlinear twist uh, about, let's say, in this case, the z axis. What I do for this Hamiltonian in this case is that I fix my parameter alpha to be 1.4. And uh, my lambda is my chaoticity parameter. So in this Hamiltonian, as I crank up lambda, I'm going to go from a regular phase space to a mixed phase space to a very chaotic phase space. So let's see how does the dynamics 
so uh, sorry are you missing any time in that uh, you unitary operator or you are taking time in this, this is a floke operator unitary operator for a one period of time so now time is an integer everything no, is constant so now the tau which you have written in your hamiltonian is missing in fx into tau right uh no this is a delta k at each periodic no, tau uh, Yeah, yeah, that tau I am saying. So it should be also in f x tau, right? No, I don't see how. Because you have evolution between zero and time tau by alpha f x, right? Uh, well, so, yeah. See, this is a delta impulse at every period tau. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So between zero and tau, you evolve Actually, with alpha uh, alpha f x. If I may interrupt, uh, Devendu, it might yeah. be better if we hold on to some questions till the very end. No, because this is very basic. Okay. But actually, I, I still I don't see what you are saying. But okay, let's just proceed. Uh, this is so. The bottom line is that this is uh, the unitary uh, evolution over one period of the system from zero to tau. So. Uh, as i crank up uh, the chaoticity parameter uh, i go from a regular to a mix to a completely chaotic phase space so now the question is that how does uh, the chaos in the dynamics affect the tomography process uh, this is one of the central results um, on the y axis i have the fidelity fidelity of uh, 100 random states uh, average fidelity and on the x axis is time and time is precisely the kick of the kick top this time is as i said uh, earlier uh, coarse grain uh, or time is so each uh, each value of time is an integer um, and uh, uh, this is the time at period 1 period 10 period 20 period 30 so on and so forth so as i see as, as i crank up chaos in the system i am getting higher fidelities and more information gain uh, in the process of tomography very analogous to uh, the classical analog of uh, kolmogorov's ni entropy uh, so now i come to what was one of the questions uh, how do we how do we quantify these things so essentially the uh, the quality of tomography is captured by this quantity the covariance matrix if i write the covariance matrix inverse of covariance matrix in the super operator picture here i have the operators written in the super operator picture uh written this way it's illuminating because now i can see that the eigen vectors of the inverse of covariance matrix specify the directions in the operator space that have been measured and the eigen values uh gives me the signal to noise ratio of those various directions that have been measured so one can use uh, not only the information of the inverse of covariance matrix but essentially it turns out that for a multivariate uh, system multivariate gaussian system uh, uh, the covariance matrix is related to the fisher information so just as an example for a fisher information basically tells you the amount of information your measurement uh, sampled from a given probability distribution has about a parameter so for a univariate gaussian the fisher information is related to the variance the narrower the variance the more peaked i am about a parameter the higher is my fisher information uh, for a multivariate gaussian uh, instead of the variance i have the covariance matrix essentially and uh, the bottom line is that uh, i can work in a a basis where all the directions and the errors are independent and uh, then trace of the covariance matrix captures the collective fisher information of this measurement protocol so the bottom line of these two slides was that i have one particular number one over trace of covariance matrix which is a collective information which tells me how well i am doing my dynamics is doing capturing the information in the tomography process so that's how the plot of fisher information versus chaoticity look like 
Again, on the y-axis, I have the Fisher information, and on the x-axis, I have the uh, time. And as uh, I increase in time, uh, the amount of Fisher information I get uh, as a function of chaos is very positively related to the degree of chaoticity in the system. So um, again, I'll probably, uh, you know, uh, going a bit uh, ahead of time, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, we can use uh, our results to verify how well our uh, analysis agrees with the random matrix theory. So the random matrix conjecture is that when the Hamiltonian or a Floquet map is completely chaotic, then its statistical properties can be described by a random matrix picked from an appropriate ensemble. So uh, what is it used? So basically you can treat random matrix theory as uh, you know, uh, you know, something going beyond statistical mechanics. In statistical mechanics, I typically deal with ensembles and I give up the on the initial conditions of the system. Random matrix theory I have given up on the system itself, meaning I just model my globally chaotic Hamiltonian as one random matrix consistent with certain symmetries of the system. And uh, remarkably, random matrix conjecture that uh, the properties of the completely chaotic Hamiltonians should agree with random matrices of a certain symmetry class agrees remarkably well. So why do we do that? Well, basically, not only we get uh, very nice predictions uh, for uh, the fidelity using the actual Hamiltonian and random matrices, Fisher information. I didn't talk about this thing, uh, but not only this, it also gives us uh, very good analytical bounds. So uh, I just refer to one of the papers with my student where we were able to use random matrix theory to calculate the absolute bounds on uh, information gain uh, using uh, random matrix theory. So I won't go into that, but you know you can have a look at this paper. So what did we learn so far? Um, quantum chaos is intimately related to information gain and consequences are manifested in the fidelities of reconstruction. Uh, information gain in chaotic systems, you know, has a remarkable agreement with, and in some sense, our approach is very similar to the Kolmogorov-Sinai uh, formulation of a classical chaos. We are trying to extend it random chaos. And uh, let's see. So till now, I was dealing with random states. And uh, what about the quantum tomography of coherent states? See, this is how typically a random state looks in the phase space. It's scattered all over the phase space, and coherent states are very highly ordered objects uh, in the in the phase space. So, if I perform tomography, uh, I remarkably get dramatically opposite behavior for tomography of coherent states versus the random states. So, on the left hand side of the figure, I had the average fidelity gain for random states uh, positively correlated to chaos. On the other hand, when I try to reconstruct or obtain information about unknown coherent states, uh, these objects are actually remarkably opposite or negatively correlated with chaos. As I am cranking out chaos, I am actually declining in the information gain and obtained fidelity. So how do I explain this? So again, you know, I'll just come back to my analogy over here. Uh, essentially, the role of uh, prior information. So as you know that guessing the second puzzle involving Q was easier and that is because there was a huge prior connected to this word Q. So anything with Q and Z has to have quiz uh, in some sense and this is exactly what's happening. So uh, over here I am again writing the probability of a state row zero given my measurement record, my dynamics and my uh, measurement procedure. So if you can look at it, just try to focus on this object. The first term over here captures the role of the dynamics. We had the maximum likelihood estimate and the properties of the covariance matrix uh, that determined the Fisher information. Uh, the second quantity over here, which is the probability of an unknown state row zero given a particular sequence of measurements and the measurement strategy. This is a prior information. Uh, 
Now, for random states, this was a constant factor. But coherent states are very, very sharp objects in the phase space, and they have a huge prior information. Um, in some sense, uh, the probability of having a highly localized coherent state with parameters R given a sequence of measurements. Uh, depends upon the nature of measurements I'm making and how localized my measurements are in the phase space. So, for example, if I start with the dynamics which is going to scramble and spread the operators uh, is going to scatter uh, my dynamics all over the phase space. That is very good in trying to get as much information about a random state uh, in a in a sense of mixing as possible, but it is actually detrimental for coherent states. So this is in this slide. Actually, we capture that. So I'm not going into details. You can look at this paper, but uh, sorry, I did not understand the word phase space because are you doing quantum system or classical now? Uh, this was quantum tomography. So fetch space in the sense. Uh, uh, so, so we have a uh, well, OK, so this is a this is essentially a you can regard. A, a quantum phase space as well. Uh, are you familiar so, with? Uh, I guess are you trying to say this? These are your coherent state uh, exactly. variable. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so this is this is a state randomly spread over all all over the phase space. This is a coherent state which is highly localized in the phase space. Yeah, I guess theta and phi which determines coherent state. That's what yeah. we're trying to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so the bottom line is that uh, um, information gain for uh, uh, coherent states depends upon. Uh, how well or how badly my operator gets spread due to chaotic dynamics. So essentially the on the left hand side is my plot which I showed for fidelity of reconstruction of coherent states and this was negatively correlated with the degree of chaos and uh, on the right side uh, I try to capture how well my operator points in the direction of that particular coherent state as time goes on. So I can see that um, for a very, very regular dynamics, if my operator points highly along the direction of the coherent states, I get more information and that actually is consistent with the fidelity plot we have seen. So one another way of capturing that is the Husimi entropy, which essentially is an estimate of how well my operator is spread over the phase space. Uh, so on the y axis, I plot the Husimi entropy or how scattered my operator is on the phase space and on the x axis the time and you can see that uh, the dynamics which is scattering the operator the least is actually very optimal to uh, reconstruct coherent states. However, the dynamics which chaotic dynamics in general which spreads a fiducial operator all over the phase space. It's actually very good in reconstructing uh, the random states. Essentially, the argument is the following that for a state scattered all over the phase space, I immediately need information in all possible directions. Whereas for a coherent state, that scattering of information actually is detrimental to me. I need very, very specific information for a coherent state because coherent states have a huge prior. And that essentially is captured by uh, these sort of plots. So Essentially, what we learned was, uh, you know, uh, chaos helps in reconstruction random states. In fact, chaos is detrimental for reconstruction of coherent states uh, because in any information pro processing protocol, we need to consider the bias or the prior knowledge uh, of the protocol. Okay, so coming back to the question, we asked that uh, can we trust analog quantum information processing pro protocols? Or what's the connection between many body physics, quantum chaos and quantum simulations? So for that, uh, I go back to my uh, previous slide uh, that uh, when I described that, OK, you know, uh, we have quantities like the Loschmitty Co, which capture how 
sensitive the chaotic system is to the Hamiltonian. The question we ask how effective it is or how detrimental it is uh, or under what conditions sensitivity to parameters in the Hamiltonian will influence our ability to perform information processing tasks. So for that, I consider quantum tomography under the presence of errors. So again, um, I have my measurement record, which is uh, basically uh, expectation values of a Hermitian observable evolved. And uh, this is an example of a zero error tomography. When I precisely know my unitary dynamics, I know what sequence of unitary dynamics to apply and I get time evolved operators in the Heisenberg picture. Now I consider perturbed Hamiltonians in general. Uh, so this is essentially what's happening or what my protocol is. If you look at the last line over here, my experimental data is coming because of the actual dynamics, which is U prime dagger U prime, which is has noise in it. But these are errors which are inadvertent. I don't even know that these errors exist. So the system I am modeling, I am modeling thinking that I have zero error tomography. So now the question I ask is that when there are errors in my experiment in the lab, which I don't even know about due to perturbations, how well I would do in this sort of a reconstruction process when I am modeling the system dynamics to be error free. And essentially that's the message in one slide I want to give that uh, uh, chaos actually screws us in this sense. Um, for similar perturbations, the fall in fidelity uh, for same perturbations is more for chaotic systems. And as I go to mixed space less and as I go to regular space, it's even less. And this was, of course, uh, the data where uh, I had uh, uh, the fidelity of reconstruction, which was uh, noiseless. So as I'm adding noise to the system, I'm doing worse as I'm cranking up the chaos in the system. So um, I just want to quickly mention some of the uh, other work. Uh, this is out of time correlators, uh, which is a much more conventional way of uh, studying quantum chaos. So essentially the idea is uh, uh, from classical physics. What happens is that if I take the Poisson bracket of uh, let's say generalized position and momentum variables, I can show that for chaotic systems, they scale with uh, the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, and uh, this is also what we discussed, the butterfly effect or exponential sensitivity to initial conditions classically. So what happens quantum mechanically when I change these to uh, commutators? So that essentially uh, changing, naturally changing uh, the classical Poisson brackets to quantum commutators is uh, this object is then called as the out of time ordered correlator and uh, in analogy with the, the classical Poisson brackets. Uh, we take the expectation. So by convention, usually we take the expectation value of this commutator over the maximally mixed state, but the bottom line is that this quantity, the out of time ordered correlator in exact analogy with classical Poisson brackets uh, is a very interesting or a very uh, uh, very concrete diagnostic for quantum chaos. Typically, uh, out of time ordered correlators are uh, characterized by short time exponential growth. So as you can roughly think that as classical trajectories uh, are exponentially separated from each other uh, and that is reflected in this uh, Poisson bracket structure. Uh, out of time ordered correlators also show this sort of an exponential growth till something called as the Ehrenfest time, uh, which is basically the time to which in general uh, the classical expectation uh, quantum expectation values agree with uh, classical uh, trajectories. And uh, this Ehrenfest time essentially depends upon the log of the dimension of the system uh, divided by the Lyapunov exponent. So that is the benchmark for uh, 
uh, smelling chaos and this exponent which you get from a semi log plot that would be in some sense extracting the quantum Lyapunov exponent of the system. So we tried this for a bunch of systems. So I'll just give you a, a snapshot of it. So for the kick top, for example, when I calculate the out of time order correlation uh, on the semi log plot, I do see uh, an exponential growth uh, till the RNFest time and then the OTOCs uh, saturate to a particular value. Uh, we also played around with other kind of systems. Uh, for example, this is another kick coupled system. Uh, not the kick top, but this is basically two spins I and J coupled together and then one of the systems being periodically kicked. So I have I and J processing about each other with periodically J being kicked. Uh, physically, you can regard them as the nuclear spin and the electron spin with the electron spin being kicked. Again, I have the Floquet operator. And uh, when I follow this sort of an analysis, by the way, this is how the phase space looks like. Uh, now I am fixing beta to be pi by two. Beta was the uh, parameter over here uh, related to the strength of the magnetic field and alpha was the uh, hyperfine coupling. Uh, as I crank up alpha, the phase space goes from regular to mixed to very chaotic. And indeed, I see signatures of uh, the growth of OTOCs uh, where my initial operators are I and G, I and J, I spin and J spin, and I see an exponential growth of OTOCs uh, uh, till the RNFest time uh, for this sort of a system. So the bottom line is that we talked about various ways of characterizing chaos uh, in the system uh, in, in quantum mechanics. One was a convention route taking the classical Yapanov exponents and the out of time ordered correlator, which is also related to the Aaron-Fest time. The, it rises exponentially till the arrest time and it is related to information scrambling. The other was our route of quantum tomography and that was more akin to the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. As in, as I am tracking a trajectory or a time series, how well I am doing obtaining information about the point in phase space or in quantum mechanics about the tomography. So the question is that, uh, of course, you know, one of the outstanding questions is that uh, can we unify all these quantum signatures? We also talked about uh, perturbations uh, classically and also quantum mechanically. And uh, the idea is or the future plan is to give all this uh, signatures or the ways to characterize chaos. Lyapunov exponents, OTOCs, operator spreading, tomography, uh, in a in a sort of a unified framework. So I guess the road ahead, I just you know, I just leave this to questions and discussions, but essentially. Uh, yeah, that was that was it. Thank you. How are, how are we doing on time? Uh, we have time for questions, more questions, in yeah. fact, and uh, thanks a lot for the uh, talk uh, vibe have. So uh, let's thank the speaker for the uh, talk and let us then open the floor for questions. Anybody who has questions can please raise their hands now and I will uh, call out the names in a sequence. Uh, yes, Dibyendu. Okay, so maybe first that which I could not understand because when you are writing this unitary operator, I felt you are missing one tau. Can you please go to that slide? Yeah. Yes. So now you see that uh, when you are writing, uh, of course, h bar 1, then you are having this evolution from uh, 0 to tau and then you are kicked by the second term. So from mm -hmm. 0 to tau, you have evolution by alpha fx and then a impulse uh, or twist, whatever you call alpha by lambda by 2 of this one. So uh -huh. then when you write u1, you should have like what is evolution? Exponential of minus i h but, 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 by h bar, right? But this alpha fx can be on throughout. No, no, that, that's why I'm saying you are having that, but then tau, so, because this is u1, it's for each unit of time, this evolution operator, unitary evolution operator, right? Yeah. Unitary so, evolution is for uh, each, so, uh, you know, for one period. 
yeah one period is tau that's why i'm saying it should be e to the power minus alpha uh, fx tau are you talking about the unitary or the hamiltonian u1 i am talking about u1 uh u1 okay i still don't see maybe we should take it offline it's a oh. i think it's a good point i mean the essential point is that once this delta kick is activated you can pretty much as well neglect this guy you know that is understand that what i'm yeah. saying to your unitary operator uh, should have a tau there okay yeah. i'll maybe okay. it is absorbed okay. somewhere uh, i don't see it right now but so yeah. these people do right like in, te in terms of t minus n tau just t minus n and tau is 1 i guess that is what probably you are assuming probably yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, okay uh, apurva you have a question yeah i actually have a comment not that much of a question mm -hmm. this is that there is yet another way to look at uh, quantum chaos of course it is related uh, and that is to consider the density matrix itself as a phase space because uh -huh. it has a symplectic structure uh -huh. so you can take the classical analog uh, of the chaos as a trajectory in phase space as an uh -huh. evolution of the density matrix in the quantum space the uh -huh. only thing which is new is the quantum density matrix and the whatever conjugate coordinates they are going to be smeared so yes. you will not have point like trajectories but you have a smeared uh, area which will evolve in time very Now, true very true what will happen under evolution is that the hamiltonian and uh, the measurement operator in which you will extract some expectation value uh -huh. they need not commute and when yeah. that is the case the area on the density matrix uh, space mm -hmm. will get uh, deformed like a squeezing operation absolutely the area cannot change in uh, size because of the lewin theorem absolutely deform according to squeezing operation and yeah. squeezing can be interpreted as exponential growth in one direction and uh, exponential shrinking in another direction and yes. if the hamiltonian and the measurement operators are misaligned you can yeah. use that as a laplanov exponent absolutely absolutely yeah yeah what you are saying is uh, uh, actually very true uh, you know people study things like uh, delocalization participation ratio uh, how an initially localized wave packet gets delocalized in a in a given basis so i think those things are very intimately connected and also related to what you said you know this the stretch and the compression is related to perhaps the lyapunov exponents there are other correlated uh, uh, you know there is something called as the notion of generalized entanglement which also has to do with how you know these wave packets spread over the phase space so those things are also very related as diagnostic tools for chaos uh, so yeah i mean all these things are very intimate and even if you look at this erenfest correspondence and the otocs i talk about imagine if your wave packet spread so much that it wraps around all the phase space where the quantum corrections start coming up that is precisely your erenfest time till which time you will have uh, exponential growth of these otocs and then that growth of otocs gets saturated because uh, of this wrapping and the stretching and the folding of this wave packet so that the quantum corrections become significant But thank you yeah that's a that's a that's a that's a very valid comment so uh, thank you apurva so uh, any further questions yeah sorry can i ask now one more question Okay the bien please go okay so i i have actually two questions so one is this tomographic part is it possible for like a many body system like you are mostly considering one kick top even if you uh -huh. many kick tops which are even uh, having some kind of interaction so uh -huh. can one thinks about uh, tomography which you was mostly describing for your part of the talk or even in impact theory which you are trying to think so yes. is it possible to do for uh, multiple kick uh, kick tops and uh, their uh, yeah, yeah, 
yeah yeah that, i think that's a very good question and i think that is very much possible it's just that uh, you know these numerical procedures for large hilbert spaces and large dimensions becomes uh, but essentially when i told you you know when i described this particular slide of connecting all these things uh, see so for example otocs have been studied uh, uh, for these many body system for icing chains yes yes exactly it was so but the idea is to explore how far we can take this uh, kolmogorov sanai approach or the uh, intuitively what's happening is the operators are spreading yes in the phase space and that leads to otoc growth but if you look at it that if i have a random state over this many body system the more my operator spreads the more i'm going to smell uh, the initial state the initial random state where it was spread over all this icing chain or a many body system so what you are saying is actually uh, true and that's a good point that uh, if there is a connection between these two approaches using tomography to smell chaos or otoc to smell chaos since otoc is already been extensively used on spin chains and icing chains and many body systems it would yeah. be interesting to explore this tomography aspect over these sort of systems actually we are working on that but uh, okay. very slowly but thanks okay. okay okay so that was one and another was i would like to understand which you probably explain but i missed is about the initial state of random versus coherent state so you have very different behavior and you try to explain the prior information for the coherent state maybe the reason but can you please re explain a little bit more okay so uh, imagine i have a random state okay uh, what is the best strategy my best strategy would be to measure all directions very evenly that would be my best strategy like you know if a dynamics scatters my operators in such a way that my operators also become very random all over the phase space then i'll have information about the random state just what we discussed right now let's say i have a many body system where my state has support over all the sites mm -hmm. then i need a dynamics that scatters my observables all over these sites to get up information about that random state okay for a localized state however i am wasting uh, randomizing it so much localized states are something like very pointed objects and my radar needs to be very precise locating those particular states and that's why chaos kills me over there because essentially chaos is scattering and scrambling information which actually works for random states but coherent states are very highly ordered objects for which i need highly pointed observables so for example i'll give you a very simple example let's say i am on a block sphere my and let's say my unknown quantum state was the eigen state of the z operator like okay. it was on the it was on the north pole my state was mm -hmm. on the north mm -hmm. now my random operator measurement of my random operator is not going to help me much but if i have a highly localized operator like the sigma z operator okay that in a single shot is going to reveal all the information to me mm -hmm. and that is because the initial state has such a big prior that i need highly specialized operators and actually in that sense chaos kills us because chaos makes all these operators non special and random in some sense okay okay i don't know okay. whether um, audible can i ask a question yes yeah sure. Yes, oh, I'm yes. sorry, I could not uh, raise my hand. I was wondering, you know, your lecture, Dr. Vaiba, was very interesting. Thank I you. I just had a simple question: whether the kind of information that you have gained uh -huh. can be applied to a concrete problem, let's say a helium atom or a three-body problem, and figure out whether it is classical or it's right, heading towards the quantum state. Uh, it was not clear to me how exactly you would say a particular system is uh, in a classical state or in a quantum state for us to use uh, the theory, you know, classical theory of chaos. I does not at least mm -hmm. something that I am an so, engineer, so please excuse me for no, this. Uh, not at all. No, not, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So essentially, uh, the focus of this talk was purely quantum mechanical. Classical oh. mechanics was our crutch to follow yes. and. Uh, try to understand how far the analogies of classical systems go into quantum mechanics right so essentially what all we described was quantum dynamics and then the estimations process was purely classical i mean once you have the data in the lab then 
that's the end of quantum mechanics then all your classical processing processing of the data starts mm -hmm. now your question about uh, uh, i think your question is that uh, slightly related to one of my earlier slides which is that i mean how the hell even i can smell any sort of quantumness in the system is that your question or something like that yeah, like, if i just imagine the helium atom to get uh, bigger and bigger uh -huh. i would just like to know whether uh, you would be able to tell me whether it is heading towards chaotic uh, behavior or it continues to follow the quantum mechanics uh, you know behavior uh -huh. i see so uh, see for chaos uh, for example uh, uh, people use these tools like uh, level statistics so mm -hmm. what happens for chaotic hamiltonians or chaotic systems is that their level statistics show a certain kind of a behavior uh, yes. which is a signature for uh, uh, chaos in the quantum system and uh, for regular systems uh, those level statistics are very poissonian in nature they don't show level repulsion so that can be one of the ways but okay. uh, for lower dimension systems i think now uh, you know the engineering in the labs mm -hmm. are getting to this sort of an exquisite control where you we can use things like measuring out of time order correlators how mm -hmm. uh, you know information is spreading through a hamiltonian and things like that uh, okay. and you know there are various protocols to uh, you know because you started out very nicely with that border uh, between quantum mechanics and classical yeah, mechanics it, 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 it's still, i think you also have to include this information science as a big part of the border for absolutely. us to uh, take advantage of your uh, very interesting uh, results thank you very yeah. much once again and wish you all the best thank you okay uh, any other questions if not i have a quick question vaibhav sure. so in the introduction to your talk you said that a classical so uh, if you just take classical systems uh -huh. for a minute just take a classical systems mm -hmm. you have a regular system and a chaotic system chaotic systems usually display this stretching and folding sort of if you think yeah. of it in terms of the baker map so yeah. they cover a larger uh, you know they access more of the phase space more quickly is there yeah. a quantitative result which mm -hmm. talks about how quickly and mm -hmm. relating it to some probably it should be related in some sense to the lyapunov exponents in the system absolutely right? absolutely so see there is this ergodic hierarchy where you know you have this uh, regular systems ergodic systems mixing systems strongly mixing systems and turbulent systems uh -huh. essentially they deal with this volume of space space you say you have a drop of ink how rapidly it's spreading out all over the phase space so you know there is this all a uh, way to characterize how well this ink is spreading across the water or the fluid uh, okay. in notion of mixing and yeah i mean all those things are very intimately tied to uh, you know things like lyapunov exponents and so on and so forth okay okay all right uh, any other questions from the attendees If no further questions we will thank uh, professor Vaibhav again for his wonderful talk and then uh, we'll conclude the session here Thank you again thank you Bala thank you Apurva thank you everyone Akshay thank you Thank you Vaibhav Bye thank you thank you Dibendu bye So bye. I will log huh? Bala Yeah 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 thank you Yeah thanks Bye